I was actually born in Dallas. My mother and daddy lived in Carrollton at the time. And so when I came out of the hospital, I, I was in Carrollton. I've been in Carrollton ever since. I read that in 1945, there was a little over 900 people here, so it probably was less than that, probably maybe about 800. It was a really fun time. Carrollton was a good place to grow up. Uh, the kids, we had no TV, so we listened to radio. We had our regular radio shows that we, we would watch and listen to, and Mother and Daddy would uh, be in their bedroom, and my sister and I would go in and we would play games or do something quiet while we listen to all our favorite shows every night, just the way people do TV today. And we had no air conditioning, so the kids played outside nearly all the time. And if, if the weather was nice, and we rode bikes all over town. Um, we played with all the kids in the neighborhood. We'd get together and the girls would play hopscotch and jacks. And uh, at night, around dusk, it was really fun to play kick the can and hide the seat, hide and seek because then you could hide and it was harder for people to find you. And we lived right next to a uh, spring-fed creek and uh, there were some woods right beside our house. And so we had trails all through the woods and we played Tarzan and all kinds of things like that in the woods. And we, at Halloween, we would go trick-or-treating all over town and we never worried about anybody giving us anything that wasn't, you know, for, good enough for us to eat. We got all kinds of homemade treats like cookies and candies and popcorn balls and things like that. And our parents didn't have to go with us. We just went by ourselves and we would come and check in every now and then and then we'd go out again. And uh, we did, my, the kids in my neighborhood would go on bike rides. Uh, the man behind me, Mr. Sumner, had several girls and he would take all the kids on Saturdays and, and we would go, he'd get us all together and we'd go on a bike ride. He'd follow us in his um, pickup and we'd ride miles out of town. And then we'd find a shady spot and have a picnic. And then if we were too tired, he would put our bikes in the back of his pickup and we'd ride back with him. But it was just a really fun time. It was, we didn't worry about anything. Uh, People, you know, left their doors open, their, their cars unlocked, left the keys in the cars. I can remember in the summertime, the most we did to protect ourselves at night when we went to sleep was to lock, latch the front screen. You know, the front door would be open. All the windows would be open. We just didn't worry about uh, a lot of the things that the kids and the people have to worry about today. It was, it was carefree and I think if I think about anything that I worried about, it was probably that the Russians were going to drop a bomb on us or that, uh, that we would get polio. We were scared to death of polio because there was no vaccine then. And I can remember when I was, I think I was at high school, maybe a freshman, was when the Salk vaccine came out. And we went to one of the elementary schools and we all got vaccinated. We didn't, it wasn't a shot. It was on a, they put the, the, whatever it was, on a sugar cube, and we ate the sugar cube, and then we didn't have to be scared of polio anymore. But I did a lot of reading. The, uh, the librarian at the high school got books, I think, maybe from the Dallas Public Library, and she would bring, they would just bring a whole lot of books out in the summertime, and she would open the library in the mornings, two or three mornings a week, and we would, go up there and get books. They were spread all over the tables in the library. And that was one of my favorite things to do. And then in the afternoons when it was really hot, we would come in the house and rest and read books. Just, and then when the sun started going down and it cooled off a little bit, we were outside again. Well, you really knew everybody in town. And, and when we'd ride our bikes around town, I had a best friend, uh, her name was Gwen Blanton, and she and I would we'd get we'd go out in the morning and we'd start riding bikes and we'd go all over town. If we saw somebody we knew, we would stop at their house. Our parents didn't worry about us. They didn't want to know where we were every you know second. And the only thing I can remember my mother saying is that when we'd leave the house, she'd always say, "When the whistle blows, come home." And that was the twelve o'clock whistle. They, the fire whistle blew every day at twelve o'clock. I don't know really for what reason, but. It did, and so when the whistle blew, we knew it was time to come home and have lunch. Yeah, we were just about two blocks from the square, and my friend and I would walk to the square 
a lot to, on errands from our parents or uh, to get the mail. Uh, and lots of times when we would walk, we would stop at the Rainbow Pharmacy and get an ice cream cone or a malt or something before we came home. So that was part of the fun. When the city began to move and grow, it began to move east. And a lot of the businesses began to move east. And for a while, I was really worried about the square, that it would just, you know, be gone. But thankfully, it's, it's really stayed active and stayed still so good. Yeah, the square was very, it was, it was the hub of all the activity in Carrollton. Everybody did their shopping on the square. And the thing that I, when I started thinking about this, I, the thing that's interesting to me is that there were, there were so many shops that there were two of. There were two grocery stores that I remember. There were two dry goods stores. There were two five and dime stores. There were two auto supply stores. There were, um, I think there were two barber shops. There was just, you know, there just wasn't one. You would think that in a small town this size, there would be just, but there was, there was a lot of variation in, in the stores on the square. And they changed from time to time. So, you know, it, it depends what years you're talking about. But um, it, was, it was a fun place to go. You'd walk around the square and you'd speak to everybody you met because you knew everybody you met. And the, the stores, were different from they are today because most of them would let you charge. And I, I remember Perry's Grocery Store, um, that's where my mom shopped, and we had, you had charge accounts. You would go in, you would buy your groceries, they would write it up on a little ticket, and they would put it with all your other tickets, and then at the first of the month or whenever you got ready to pay your bill, you'd just pay for the whole month. Um, Godfrey's Department Store was like that. You could charge and then, and they weren't, it wasn't anything like Visa or Master Charge, it was just a store charge, and, and most of the other stores did that too, I think. And then some of the grocery stores, one of the grocery stores, I'm not sure if Perry's did, but Young's Grocery Store delivered groceries. So you could just call down there and, um, and, they, and tell them what you wanted, and they had teenage boys that worked there in the summertime and after school, and they would deliver your groceries. And they would bring it to your house, and if you weren't home, they would just come in your back door, sit it on your kitchen cabinet, and you had your groceries. It was just that simple. When I was 14, I started working in uh, one of the five and dime stores. And you know, a lot of people don't even know what a five and dime store is anymore, but it's kind of like a dollar store today, except it didn't have, it didn't have food, groceries, things like that. But it was a fun place to work, and I worked there all through high school. I loved school. And we didn't have kindergarten. I started in first grade. And it was a, a two-story red brick building. And there were eight or nine classrooms. It, and it was first grade through eighth grade. There was one grade of every grade, every class. And there, wasn't, there weren't any indoor bathrooms. The bathrooms were outside uh, in, a little room, in a little house out behind, so if you needed to go to the restroom, you had to go outside in the weather and go to the bathroom and come back in. And there was a basement where we had, that was where the cafeteria was, and also in the basement there was a little store that a lady, her name was Aunt Mary Fike, and it was Aunt Mary's store, and she sold school supplies, and she sold ice cream and candy and things like that, and it was so much fun to go to Aunt Mary's. Whenever I was, when I was eighth grade, they built Carrollton Elementary, which was the first new elementary school they had built. And so my eighth grade year, I was in Carrollton Elementary. And then uh, the high school was right next to the red brick school. And it was really fun when we were in elementary school because we loved to spy on the high school kids and they were fascinating to us. And there was a, there was a sh uh, shrubs hedge that divided the elementary school from the high school. And we used to climb in those shrubs and spy on the, the high school kids. <laughs> and when, then when I got in high school, uh, that was a really good time. We, I loved high school. And it was a small high school. You knew everybody in the school. And um, my husband, well, he was my boyfriend then, but he, he played sports. And so, I, of course, I went to all the sporting events. and the whole town would turn out for the football games. 
And after the football games, if you won the game, there was a victory bell on top of the gym. And if we won the game, some of the football players would climb up a ladder and get on top of the gym and ring the victory bell, which you could hear all over Carrollton. And that way, if you didn't get to come to the game, you'd at least know that the high school team had won the game that night. And then when I was a senior, I was a cheerleader, and uh, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that a lot. And my husband played basketball too, and he was a, he was a good basketball player. And so I really went to nearly all the sporting events all four years. Had some really good teachers. Had uh, an English teacher, Georgia Ogle, that I just really, really loved. And she was so good that she even got senior boys to love Shakespeare. So I thought that was, that was an accomplishment, but uh, it was a really fun time. I, did, I remember that after the football games, it was a lot of fun because the, if you had a date, you would always go to more barbecue, which was down on the highway. It was, they had car hops and uh, all the kids would gather there and uh, relive the, rehash the, what had happened at the game that night. And you'd see all your friends, and you'd talk, and, and just have a really good time. It was just it was, it was just a fun, fun thing to do. My husband would after he would take me home after a date, my boyfriend at that time, he he would go down in, to the square, and a lot of the boys would sit down there. They would, after they'd taken their girls home, you know, they would sit down there and and just visit, or shoot the breeze, they called it, and. One of my good memories of that is I didn't go down there a lot with him because it was usually just the guys. But a couple of times he would take me down there and Pop Woods, who was the night watchman in Carrollton, would come by, he would come by and visit with the boys and just, you know, talk with them. And sometimes he would open Rainbow Pharmacy and he would let us in the pharmacy and he would fix malts or whatever you wanted to drink. And we'd sit on the bar stools, you know, in front of the counter and drink our malts. He never did turn on all the lights. He'd just turn on enough so that he could see what he was doing. And after you got through with your malts, well, he would wash the dishes, clean it up. We'd put our quarters on the cash register and we'd leave and he'd lock the door again. And that was, you know, I think about today, if, if there were a group of boys, you know, gathered anywhere, they'd think it was a gang or they were doing drugs or, there was something going on. But at that time, that's just where they went and gathered and visited, and, and the night watchman came and visited with them. They all had a good time down there. Pop Wood sounds like a character. I think he was. I didn't know him, I didn't know him really well, but he was, I think he was a night watchman for a long time, and that's really about the only policeman that I remember for a long time. I don't even know if we had a policeman in, until, uh, late 40s or early 50s. Some of the stores on the square, um, well, Perry's Grocery Store, and there was Young's Grocery Store. There was, um, there was a doctor that was in Rainbow Pharmacy for a while. They, there was a little mezzanine kind of, they'd built some stairs, and, and he had two rooms upstairs. And when I was really young, that's where I would go to the doctor. And if you were really good at the doctor's office, then when you came downstairs, my dad would get me an ice cream cone. And so, but then he moved on the other side of the square, but there was uh, Godfrey's department store is where my mother shopped mostly. There was Roten's department store also. But my mother made all of my clothes and, God, and Godfrey's had a lot of material. And so that's where she usually bought the material for my, whatever she was making. My dad at first, um, when I was born, he was, he ran a couple of uh, uh, gas stations, one right that was on the square that's not there anymore, and one that was just off of the square. And then he worked for Homer Clayton Ford Company. And, and Homer Clayton's off Ford Company was just a couple of doors off the square when I was just a little girl. And Vandergriff Chevrolet Company was on the square, actually. It, their showroom was on the square, and then they, in later years, they built right just off the square, a new building. But just about everything you needed, you found in Carrollton. And if you really needed to do some real big shopping, you went to Dallas, you went to downtown Dallas. And 
My mother would take us with her sometimes when she would go. She would ride the bus. We would ride the bus to downtown Dallas and we'd shop. They had, Dallas was different then because it had uh, lots of stores and, and shopping. And all that kind of died away after they started building the malls and things, you know, around. But it was a great place to shop then. When I was in high school, my friend and I would, we would get on the bus and we'd ride to Dallas and we'd go to a movie and we'd eat and we'd shop and then we'd get on the bus and come back home. We went to the movies usually. And here in, oh, when we wanted to do something, when we had a date, we would, most of the times we would go to the movies. And uh, we went most of the time in Carrollton. There were a few other movie theaters around that we would go to. I can remember a couple of prices. Um, when I was a kid, one of the things we did as a kid on Saturday afternoon, all the kids went to the movie, to the matinee. And I, I can remember that it cost nine cents when I first started going. <laughs> and uh, then I can remember later it was 14 cents. I think maybe when my husband and I were dating, it was a quarter. And, uh, but most of the time that's what we would do. We'd go to the movies, then we'd go down to Moore Brothers or somewhere and get something to eat and drink, and then that was, we'd come home. I remember the carnivals mostly. We had a carnival every year and that was a lot of fun. They would come in with, you know, lots of rides and um, lots of games. But, and everybody went to the carnival. They would stay three or four days, maybe over the weekend. And then later on, I remember the, the Carrollton Country Fair. Uh, it started, I think, maybe late 60s. And it, it probably, lasted for about 20 years and then it finally phased out. But I read somewhere, I, I know, I love to go to the carnivals, but I didn't know this when I was growing up, but I read somewhere that the volunteer fire department sponsored the carnivals to raise money for the, the fire department. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it was an interesting story. My dad was a volunteer fireman in probably in the 40s and I remember him telling the story that the, I know that the first person that got to the, after the fire whistle blew, the first person that got to the fire truck drove the fire truck to where the fire was. And, and he said that they, the fire truck was really old and it didn't run very well. They had a, I think a mechanic that was a volunteer fireman that kept it working pretty well. but. This time he was driving the truck to the fire and he said there was a dog running along beside the truck and the dog got to the fire before the fire truck did. <laughs> and uh, he was also on the city council uh, in the 40s. And I remember he, he told me this story one time. I, he, when he was on the city council, they would meet on Monday night and he would go to the city council meeting and it was always really, really late when he came home. And after many, many years, one time we were talking about it, and I said, Daddy, I said, you all really must have had a lot of business to discuss because I remember I was always asleep when, by the time you came home. He said, oh no, he said, we took care of the city business in about 30 minutes and then we played dominoes until about midnight. <laughs> well, like I said, Pop, Pop Woods was the first policeman that I remember, and he, was, he really was just the night watchman. He didn't do anything, I don't know if he, I don't think he did any kind of uh, other police work. But I, I think maybe in the early 50s, they hired the first policeman, actually hired the first policeman. And uh, I remember reading somewhere that in 1952, they got the first police car in Carrollton. But I never remember during those years more than one or two policemen in Carrollton. So there, there really wasn't, I don't think, a whole lot of crime. I don't think there was a whole lot for them to do. I remember the flood in 1949 because I remember my dad uh, got up in the middle of the night. I guess we got a phone call. And my dad got up in the middle of the night and went down to the square to help uh, move things out of the stores, you know, and help with, the, help with that effort. and. Then I remember the next morning after I had gotten up, I remember we lived two blocks from the square, and I remember water was up on the str cover of the street, all, just till, till, until about a block from my house, and I, I 
Carrollton flooded several times, and I think I've never known exactly what caused all the floods, but I do know that the Trinity River used to overflow all the time, and all the fields between there and Carrollton would be covered with water if it rained very much. And so I don't know if the Trinity River actually got high enough to flood. I know that, and it might have been 1949, but there at one time um, the Josie Ranch lake, the dam broke, and the water, there was a creek, there's a creek right beside it, and there's a, and it goes right about a block from Carrollton, from the square, and, and that may have been when it, when it flooded so bad that it flooded the town that last time, I'm not sure which flood it was, but after that, after that last flood, they widened this creek, and since they did that, we've not ever had any floods anymore. See, that's the way it was then. People just, people helped other people. You just, you were just all, like you said, one big family. And they just, you know, if you needed help, there was somebody there to help you because they knew one, someday they'd need help too, so. Well, there were a lot of, uh, the Blanton family was, um, they were very influential in town. Two of the brothers, they owned the grain company. And two of the brothers were mayors at different times. And uh, there were other really good, political people that that did a lot for the city. But when I think of of someone who really influenced the city of Carrollton, I think of Jimmy Porter. And Jimmy Porter was a black man who, I think he came here in the 20s. He had played baseball with a black league in, I think, St. Louis. And after he came to Carrollton, he, uh, he was just a fixture in Carrollton. He, you would see him walking up and down the streets when I was growing up, walking up and down the streets, and he always had his bat over his shoulder and his glove on his bat, looking for a baseball game and looking for a bunch of little boys that wanted to play. And he taught, when my husband was growing up, he, he played, they played baseball with him, and um, he came to all their baseball games at high school. And when my kids were little, they, I had four boys, and uh, they played Little League ball. And I've heard that Jimmy Porter was influential in starting Little League, Little League teams in Carrollton. And they played Little League ball, and he was always at their games. He, he would stand behind the, the batter's box, and he would cheer them on and yell for them. And uh, he was just... I don't know if, I, I guess he just did odd jobs. I don't know that he ever had a full-time job that I remember. And for a long time, he lived in uh, an old boxcar in a field. And then I have heard that the city took up funds and built him a house. And he lived at, down in the old part of Carrollton. And that's where he lived. And I have one really special memory of him. Um, when my kids were probably 10, 11, 12, one day they came in the house with a bunch of their friends and they came in to get a drink. And they said, Mom said, we're going, Jimmy Porter's out in the front yard and we're gonna go play baseball with him. And so I said, well, I said, where is he? They said, he's in the front yard. I said, well, tell him to come in and get a drink, but he wouldn't do it. And so they took him some water. And then I remember watching them walk down the street and he was, Jimmy Porter was leading the way with his bat and his glove and six or eight little boys just following behind him like he was the Pied Piper, you know, just, they were walking down to the baseball field. And he, they had, every year they had um, parades when baseball season start and the parade would, would ride all through town and end up on the square. And Jimmy Porter would ride in the parade and he was just, uh, uh, he was just an icon as far as, you know, two generations or maybe more of little boys learned so much from him and he was such a good example for them. And he, uh, they named a, a baseball field uh, on Josie Lane. They eventually named a baseball field for him. And I think there's still a plaque down there today. And he died in 1984 and he would have been 84 years old. and. He's buried in Hilltop Cemetery here in town. Yeah, I think he was probably in his 70s when he was with my kids, yeah.
but he was still he was still playing baseball every chance he got. You never saw him without his bat and his glove, and he and he walked everywhere you went. You know, so he was he was everybody knew Jimmy. I remember my mother had stamps to buy sugar. I don't know exactly how it worked, but I know she had a little book, and you would tear out stamps to buy sugar. And I know that um, gasoline was rationed. I remember that. And my, da my dad, my mother wrote, when my, before she died, she wrote a story about her life. And she, was, she told the story that um, my dad had been a block captain. I, for, when the war force started, they had moved down to Terrell, and they lived down there for a little bit. And I, I don't know if it was t at, in Terrell or here, but he was a block captain, and whenever they would have practice air raids, because I guess they were afraid that we were going to get bombed in our own country, and everybody had to pull their drapes and turn out their lights, and he would walk around the streets just to be sure that everybody, you know, all their lights were covered and they were, all the houses were dark. And I do remember when the war ended, um, we heard it on the radio, and mother went outside, and our, our neighbor behind us was uh, out in the yard with her little boy. And mother went over to see if she had heard about it, and I went with her. And she told her that she said the war has ended. You know, did you know, did you hear that? And her this little boy reached up to his mother and whispered something in her ear, and his mother just laughed and said, he wants to know if he can have a bicycle now. So I guess, uh, you know, probably uh, metal was rationed. And, you know, you were saving, everything was going to the war effort. And so when he heard the war was over, he was excited because maybe now he could get his bicycle. <laughs> My first grade teacher was fantastic. Her name was Ola Good. She had taught for years and years. In fact, she had taught some of my classmates' mothers who lived in Carrollton all that time. And she taught for many years after I was in first grade. I don't know how old she was when she retired, but she never married. And uh, you know, I remember reading Dick and Jane and doing all those fun things you do in first grade. And uh, I had a fourth grade teacher that was, her name was Mrs. Brooks. And she was excellent too. She, she made us do um, poems. We had to learn a poem a, a well-known poem every week and say it to the class. We had to do picture study, which was uh, artists, very famous artists. We would learn about their, we would have a little picture that they, had, uh, the, one of the things that they had drawn, and we made a notebook and we had to write a, uh, things about the, about this author, I mean, about the painter. And to this day, I still remember, I'll see a painting and I'll remember who painted it and you know something about it. But I think we had really good teachers, uh, you know, to be a small town. I think, I think we got really good education. My husband was a uh, postmaster here for a long time. And um, the first memory I have of the post office is, is when I was maybe five or six years old. I remember the, the postmaster or mistress, it was a lady, she lived right behind us there and she was uh, the postmistress, as I said, and uh, my mother would go in the store, some, in the post office sometimes, and they would visit. And I remember going in there with her, and her name was Robert Isom, and her husband was named Green Isom, and he had uh, uh, in the post office in the building, he had an insurance business that he operated. He was the assistant, and he had an insurance business he operated in the back of the post office, and then. Um, after we got married, and we got married in 59, and I think in 1961, my husband began work for the post office. And he worked, uh, during this time, the post office moved a couple of doors down on the square, and he was a larger facility because Carrollton had begun to grow. And during that time, he became assistant postmaster. And then in 1970, I believe, they built the first actual building, standing post office in Carrollton, which was uh, east of the square on Beltline Road. And during this time, Carrollton really, really grew 
and it was a challenge to keep enough routes because Carrollton was going through such a fast growth rate. And uh, Mitchell became postmaster in 1973, I believe, and he served as postmaster until 91. He retired in 1991. I remember um, that we when we were, um, we were, I think it was 1968 or 69, we were building a new house and we needed some extra money. And Mitchell was assistant postmaster at that time. And so Bill Sumner let us be the janitors. And so he would work all day at the post office. He would come home and eat supper. And at that time we had three little boys. And after supper, we would go back down and clean the post office. And every, all my kids had a job. They, you know, they emptied the trash cans or, you know, did, swept the floors. But um, we did that for about a year. And I think about it now, and I think there's no way that the assistant postmaster would be cleaning the post office, you know. And then also, um, a lot of times, this happened a lot of times, when the town, especially when the town was smaller, the the widows who were who were looking for their social security checks, if they didn't get it on the first, they would call Mitchell and ask him to go up and look and see if it maybe was in the box, you know, and just didn't get put it, it delivered to them. And he would do it. And if, if he found it, he would take it by their house. And so it was just a different time. <laughs> I don't think they do that today either. <laughs> If I were to think of someone that really had an impact on my life, I would have to probably say it was some people from my church because I had so many wonderful Sunday school teachers and the ministers. And the church has played such a big part in your life during uh, that time. There were really four main churches in town, and they, four or five. There was uh, the Baptist church, First Baptist church, and right across the street from First Baptist was the First Christian Church. And then there was the, it was Union Baptist Church, the name changed to College Avenue Baptist Church, just was just about a block uh, to the south. And then the Methodist Church was within another block. And those are the four main churches that I remember. And if, if one church was having some kind of special meetings, the other churches would close their doors and they'd go visit the one that was having the special meetings. Um, in the summertime, we had vacation Bible schools, and you would go, you know, if you'd go to the Christian church or you'd go to the Baptist church, you know, that's the way the kids filled up their summers, with going to different vacation Bible schools. But, and we would go to summer, I went to summer camp with my friend from the Christian church, and she'd go with me sometimes to the Baptist camp, and you just, it was just a shared experience. Probably the most dramatic thing that happened uh, in my life was in 1983, 81. Actually, my husband, he developed a, a cough and a cold that wouldn't go away. And he wound up in the hospital and we were told that he had um, myocarditis, which affected the inflammation, was an inflammation of the heart lining. And he got over that, and we thought he was fine. And a couple of years later, he began to have problems again. And at this time, he was the postmaster here in Carrollton. And eventually, a doctor told him finally that the only thing that would help him would be a heart transplant. And at that time, uh, nobody had been doing heart transplants for a long time because the first ones that were done, you know, were not successful. And so he told us that. Dr. Denton Cooley in Houston had started, just started doing them again, and he advised us that we should go see him and just see if he would be a candidate. And so we did, and we got there and found out after he went through all the tests that uh, he would, that, that's, he said, they said that's the only thing that can save you. And so at that time, you know, it was a really scary situation because everybody that we ever knew that had a heart transplant, you lived a few weeks and then you died. And, but this was his only chance, so he agreed to do it. And so we came back home, and we stayed there for about three weeks while he was going through these tests, and we came back home, and six weeks later they called us and they had a heart. 
And so we went to Houston, and uh, he got his heart, and he did really, really well. They had come up with a new, um, new drug to treat the uh, rejection problems that everyone had always had. And so he, we stayed in Houston for two months. We just, we had to leave our kids at home and we had grandparents there that were, you know, looking out for them. Most of them, they were teenagers. But we stayed in Houston for two weeks and he kind of, he really became a celebrity in Carrollton because nobody had heard of heart transplants for so many years. And he was like, I think the 19th person in Texas that got one. And he went back, after two months, he went back to, his, after four months, he went back to his job as postmaster and um, did pretty well until uh, 1991 and the, the new heart began to have problems. And so he retired in 91 and he lived a couple more years after that. He lived nine years after, two more years after that. But that was probably the most dramatic thing that that happened, has happened in my life, and it, it was just such a miracle that I've always been so thankful that yeah. that it was we were able to do that. Raising a family in Carrollton, uh, raising my kids was really just almost as simple as it was whenever I was growing up because it hadn't come to the point where you were afraid to let your child in the front yard, you know. And my kids rode bicycles all over the area. We lived in North Carrollton at the time, close to LB, um, George Bush Toll Road. And they, they would ride all day long. They played with their friends. They were out, you know. They, they, they could play until they heard their dad whistle. He had a really loud whistle, and they, and they would come home whenever they heard him whistle. But it was, it was just, they roamed around the neighborhood too, just like we did. And, and we really weren't that scared of, of uh, anything happening to them, somebody kidnapping them or you know something bad happening like that it was it was it was pretty much the same as it was when I was growing up they walked to and from school didn't worry about it in high school one of the most fun things that we would do would, was every year you had homecoming and every four years you would have a parade and it was a big deal and we would get crepe paper and decorate floats you know and and uh, the band would would I'd lead the parade, and we'd go all from the school, from the high school, we'd go down uh, Beltline Road to the square, and that's where it would end. But everybody would turn out on the sides of the, you know the street and watch the parade go by, and it was just it was just a fun time. It was a uh, I don't it, we had a lot of school spirit then because we my kids really never went to many of their class reunions because their classes were so large. And you didn't know, the only people you knew was your own little group. But at that time, when the school was small, you knew everyone. And it was just, it was just, a, it was a fun place to be. Carrollton was a fun place to grow up. I was just born in the hospital in Dallas. I, they lived in Carrollton. They lived in, they lived in one of the historic uh, homes in Carrollton when I was born, uh, the Bell Allen home. And it had a, it had a basement, and it had first floor, and it had an attic, and there was um, in the on the top floor, there was an apartment, and they lived in that apartment, and then later we moved to the, a house on Carroll Avenue, and that's where I grew up. My mother came from um, Arkansas, and then they had moved when she was a teenager. They'd moved to West Texas. She had been going to school at. Uh, TWU now, it was called something else then. And she was staying in a rooming house up there that belonged to my dad's uncle. And he would come up there to visit his uncle. And he met, they met at that, when she was in the rooming house. And then when they got married, I don't know really exactly what brought them to Carrollton. Probably a job. But they were living here. They'd been here a couple of years when I got married, I think. I mean, when I was born, I think. Tiny, Tiny Thompson was working at the post office when my husband went to work for the post office. And Tiny, Tiny had a chance to be postmaster before Mitchell. And I think he even tried it for a little bit, but he loved to be outside and he did not want an indoor job. He didn't even like to clerk. But he and Mitchell became great friends and he, he really was a mentor 
to Mitchell uh, in many ways. Besides the post office, he he loved to um, walk the route, and as he walked the route, he would memorize scripture. And he had uh, he had cards that he'd gotten from some men's Christian group, and even when they weren't working at the post office, he and Mitchell would walk the city just for fun, and memorize. He and Tiny and Mitchell would memorize scripture together. So he was—he's a great guy. He really is. Mm -hmm.